Is it working now? Okay. Hello. Um, so my name is Klaus Ibsen, and welcome to this talk about Apache Camel Microsoft's uh, microservice in containers on Kubernetes. A bit sorry about the title. It's a bit, yeah, uh, sketchy. So this is my first visit to Poland. Um, I'm impressed with the organizers. They have a, a pickup uh, service in the airport. So you just go to this desk. It's actually a professional looking desk. It's not just a guy with a little signpost. So I used the opportunity to do my first selfie. So just be, let me do the second one. <laughs> hey, I'm from the other guys. So yeah, sorry. Um, so I am a software engineer. I work for Red Hat. I've been working primarily as a full-time and lead on the Apache Camel product for more than nine years. I wrote a couple of books on Camel. Um, the second book is almost complete. We are doing the final tosses this month, and the book should be ready by start of next year. I'll put up some uh, contact details where you can find me on social media and emails and so on. So what is the goal of this talk? Uh, how many people are here are Java developers or have a Java background? Good, because this is a talk for you guys or for me as well. I'm also a, a long-term Java developer. So as a Java developer, how can we develop and write applications that can run and be packaged and run as containers? And how can we take these containers uh, and run in a cluster such as Kubernetes? That is the key message of this talk. But when you get started with container and cloud technology, there's so much more to learn. So what I'm going to talk about and show in this session is only the famous tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more things like, how does networking work in a, in a cluster? How do I get my applications to be able to communicate with each other inside, inside the clu cluster? But also, how can external clients discover my application and call into the cluster? How does you know, persistent storage work? How do I configure my application? What about security? Um, and so on. So there are many concepts that you need to, to, to learn. And also, how can I scale my applications? And what do I do when something goes wrong? You know, how do I deal with errors and so on? <coughs> but let's start from the beginning. OK, so when I run containers, I need sort of like a container cluster. And you know, the most famous one is Kubernetes. But Kubernetes isn't this, this big, scary cluster software. You know, ooh. yes, it is. It is a big, a big a bit scary software cluster especially for myself as well, because I'm traditional a Java developer that have been used to build Java application for, uh, let's say, application servers. So I just you know, have this confined world where I know about the application servers. I build my application, put it to the ops team, and they put it inside Weblogic, WebSphere, or JBoss, and so on. But now with containers, there's so many different things going on. But how do I start with Kubernetes? Do I have to go to my boss and tell him, OK, please, uh, boss, uh, install Kubernetes in these you know, server software somewhere, and then you have to wait for that to be installed and you get some credentials to log in. Or you have to sign up to some sort of online cloud provider and maybe have to pay some money for that. No, when I get started with this Kubernetes container technologies, as a developer, I would like to be in power. So if I can run and build f on my laptop, that's a very good start. So what we can do is to use run Kubernetes locally using something called a Minikube. Minikube can run in a laptop, in a computer. It's just a single node uh, cluster of Kubernetes. And the good thing about Minikube is like with Windows. If something goes wrong, you can just restart it. And you can also just delete Minikube and install it again. You know? So don't be afraid to try out and do things wrong or whatever. If something goes wrong, you can always delete and start it again. It's a bit harder if it's a shared server in your, in your company. Okay, how do you install Minikube? Well, you go to the GitHub page, Kubernetes Minikube, download it, and then you also need to download and install a client, command line tool called kubectl, and then you can start the Minikube. This is what I did, Minikube start, and it outputs something. Uh, okay, now Minikube is started, but how do I actually see it running and it's going on and so on? Well, 
You have minikube help. It shows you a list of commands you can do and minikube status. But there's also one called minikube dashboard. It gives you a link or open in the web browser, a little dashboard, so you can see um, sort of like a visual going on. But as a Java developer, let's get started. How can we build Java applications that can run in containers or run in the minikube? Um, myself, I'm a bit biased, so I like to build Java application with Camel, and this is my favorite uh, Camel. It's a Lego Camel. You know, I am from Denmark, and we have Lego. The company is also from Denmark. So it's very. The source code is on GitHub, and you can find it. There's a link later. So but let's start with a very simple application. We have a uh, sort of like a client on the server. So on the server side, we we have a little service called Hello. We, the client can call the service, and you get a response. Now in that response, we include the host name because you know we want to run our application in a cluster is more dynamic, and you know by returning the host name, we can see a different you know response depending on where it runs. So just to show that you can use different Java runtimes, we use Spring Boot as the client, and then something called Wildfire Swarm as the sort of select the server thing. It doesn't really matter, you know, it's just Java technologies, and you can run any kind of Java things as containers. And to make it easy, we use HTTP as the transport. Then I put in Camel. And if you haven't been seen or used Camel before, but there's something called a Camel route, where you can sort of define your, your integration logic. From the client side, we just don't want to manually call the service, so we can use something called a timer. So we say from a timer, then we call the HTTP, and then we log it. And on the server side, because we're running inside a wildfire swarm, we are using the undertow HTTP engine as the HTTP server to receive the cli client calls from the client and then do a message transformation. We can build these application very easy. As a Java developer, if you use Wildfire Swarm, there's a website called Web uh, Generator, and it can generate sort of like a pre-built applications, and then we add some Java code. Down here, you can't see in the back, it just says from undertow. Then we does the message transformation using a Java bean call, and this is just the Java source code for the bean. We say swarm says hello from. And then to get the host name, we use some sort of utility class, inet address util, get local host name, and return that. Uh, Spring Boot, they have a start page. You can choose and find camel as a dependencies, add that, and you have a, a product to start with. The camel route is just symbol from timer, call the SAP service, and log the response. But Okay, so far, there's nothing about containers and so on. Um, so to run applications in the containers, you need to package them as a something called a Docker image. But how do you, as a Java developer, build a Docker image? An easy way to do that, uh, if you're using Maven, is to use a Maven plugin from the product called Fabricate. It has a Maven plugin that can build Docker image uh, from your Maven products. And that's, that's what we're going to use. So all you have to do uh, is to add the Maven plugin to your Maven POM file, and more or less, you're ready to go. Um, when you work from the command shell, uh, using containers, or Minikube, and so on, and Docker, it can be a very good idea to sort of prepare the shell for this environment, where you can type Minikube Docker N. It outputs sort of like some information, and one of them is an eval expression you can run, and then it sets up your client to be able to communicate with the Minikube using Docker or the command line tools. Now, then you can build this uh, Java application using the uh, Maven fabricate colon build. It's a build goal, it builds a Docker image. So let's assume that we build these applications, we can build them as a Docker image, and now we want to run our applications as containers in the local mini cl cluster. Um, so are we ready to do that? No. I'm not sure if you can read it, but we go in a cloud or in a container environment, uh, things are very dynamic. So when you want to call a service, you cannot really assume that it's running on localhost. It's some running on node somewhere. It can be run on the same laptop, but you know, if you have a real cluster, it will be uh, many different nodes running. So it's much more dynamic. 
So as a client, how can I call this service over here without using localhost 8080 anymore? That's where you have to use something from Kubernetes that is called a Kubernetes service. So over here on the service side, you want to expose a tell that I have a service here, client can call, and this is the name of the service, Kubernetes service. Then the client just access this service. So here is sort of like the idea of that. So a client is here, and you have the service over here. On Kubernetes, your application runs in something called a pod. A pod is sort of like the minimum deployment unit that runs. But you can scale your application. So if, for example, if you have two pods with the same service over here, then we have a client here. So the client, oh, there are two services now. Which one should I call, and how do I do that? So we need something in between. And this is where the Kubernetes service come in. This is sort of like an uh, indirection that sits in between your clients and your service. So the, the Kubernetes service is implemented as a virtual network. It's actually just a virtual IP and a port norm that is static. So when the service is created, it has the same IP and port number for the entire lifecycle of that service. That's a very important thing to know. It's also a very cool thing about Kubernetes, because it allows any client that has want to use the call this service, you only need to get that IP and port number one time, and you can forever use that. Now, all the other things are dynamic. So all the applications run on these pods, but these are temporary. You know, a pod can die, you know, the process dies, or the it runs in a, in, a, in a node that sort of dies totally, or maybe the scheduler move it somewhere else, and so on. So these are dynamic, but the servers are static. And then it's Kubernetes that figures out, okay, you want to call this service? Ah, there are three pods running, I choose one for you and call it. So, now, to call the service, we just need that IP and port number, and then we can call it. But how do we get that as a client, as a Java developer? I want to call a service, but OK, I need the IP and port number. So there are different ways with Kubernetes then. One of the uh, first implementation is that a client can look up a service using uh, OS environmental variables. So when this pod starts up, all the a Kubernetes pl cluster injects all the service as environmental variables using this pattern hostname port. Then, as a client, you can just look up that uh, OS environmental variables. You have the IP and port number. So as a client, uh, in Java, you don't need a Kubernetes Java library. If you're using .NET, you don't need any .NET client and so on for Perl and so on, because any programming language can access uh, environmental variables. That's it. But and we make that quite easy in Camel to call a service. You just say service colon name using these double squiggly things, and Camel does it for you. But that's a Camel specific thing. Now, later on, uh, Kubernetes team said, OK, you can also call a service by using a DNS naming. So instead of uh, an IP and a port number, you can just use a host name. So you can give a service a name, and then you can use the service name all the time. So here I call the service hello swarm, and that's it. In fact, you can predefine the name of your service and your port number before you run your application. So for example, if you create a service in Kubernetes, you can call it foobar and call it 1234 as the port number. You can tell me that. I can build a client, want to call your service, I can hard code in my client foobar colon 1234. And when we deploy our application in the cluster, we can communicate. So that is actually a bit going back again, because as a Java developer, we always talk about never hard code anything in your client libraries or whatever, put them out in external configuration files and so on. But now Kubernetes says, nah, doesn't matter. If you want to call the service this and this is port number, they are fixed, and you can just use them forever. OK. So we just want to call the service now, and we are ready to run in the cluster. But how do we take our applications and run in a cluster in a Kubernetes? Before we learn, we can build a Docker image. But how can we take the Docker image and run in the cluster? 
And it's again, you know, the Fabricate Maven plugin is able to build the Docker image and deploy it in the cluster. That's a deploy goal. So you type Maven Fabricate colon deploy, and it does the thing for you. And we can do them for the both of them, and they are running in the cluster. Now, there's one thing I want to mention. There is also an alternative goal for the deploy. There's one called run. As a developer, it's a good one to you to know because it, it runs in, in the foreground, so to speak. So it's outputting the logs from the container in your shell as if it's running in that shell directly. And when you press Control c to terminate, it will undeploy it in, in the cluster. And that also runs, that works on any Kubernetes cluster, not only on Minikube, but if you have a company cluster, you can also, maybe in a test environment, you can do the same. Okay, so now, this is where everything can go wrong. So let's try something. Dip, dip, dip. So, just to, I have, of course, like a, a TV chef prepared food already, right? So I have a little cluster running and I have deployed the, the server side, so to speak. So if I call this link here, it's, it gives me a response back. Uh, okay, nothing so fa fancy, right? But let's try it from a shell. So from here, I have from my Mac computer, I can call inside the local mini cluster and access that service, and then it can re re show me the response. And I do that in a while loop. So if you run this one, you can see it gives the response back, and this one over here, that is the host name where that service is, or the part is running. And it's sort of like an auto-generated name. And now, pay attention, it runs up there, so I can get the parts here. There's one part running. Now I can scale it up. kubectl scale deployment hello swarm replicas equals two. And now the cluster should be able to run two parts with the same service. And then the cl fuck. Um, yeah, don't see that. <laughs> don't don't see nothing to see. Then you know the the call is is calling these two servers. And yeah, yeah. Well. Yeah, everything can go wrong, and they call it, and it's shit. Okay, uh, so hey, ah, uh, now you can see there's a different one, and there's can you look at uh, okay? So now there are two different names, right? And can anyone guess what is the algorithm for this? Round robin. Mm, okay, two one. No, it's actually not round robin, but it used to be, but Google, who created Kubernetes, ha have a lot of workloads running, right? So they actually, you know, do some look at it and see what's going on, and they think out, round routing is not the best uh, algorithm to use because it can be a bit predictable. No, it's, it's random. But it's hard to see when there's only two services, right? But that's the default one, but you can choose, right? And you can even implement your own. But, okay, coming back to that error, why was there an error? You know, I told Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes to scale up the deployment to two, and why the hell can it, no, it's on video, why the beep, can it not do that in a safe manner? So, as a developer, as a Java developer, there's some new things we have to consider. Okay, when we scale up your application, something can go wrong, even though if we use the tools from Kubernetes to do so. So, when you scale up an application, then you tell Kubernetes, okay, I want to run a not, uh, two instances of that one. Then Kubernetes starts up your application. But starting up an application takes time. Especially Java is not so fast. So what you need to do in your application is to tell it when it's ready. And only when it's ready, then allows Kubernetes to call your s application. And we did not do that. So let me go here. So what I did was, you can probably see it, but I, there is something called a probe, a readiness probe, which you need to configure. 
with your application that can tell Kubernetes when, a, when something is ready. It's, it's like a happy page when you maybe have built before. So you call an HTTP endpoint, it says yes or no if your application is running. This is the same concept in Kubernetes. There are different ways to, to implement the probe. HTTP is a one, call a shell script and so on. But there's a bug in this uh, Maven plugin. So I'm uh, using an old version of this Maven plugin that has a bug that does not cause this readiness probe to be active. So if I upgrade this plugin to the newer one, it will work. So then when you start up this part, there's a readiness probe in there that tells Kubernetes, no, I'm not ready, no, I'm not ready. Wait a while, wait a while, don't call me, no, 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 no. Now I'm ready. Okay, then Kubernetes calls you. Then, you know, when the client calls the service, only when it's ready, Kubernetes says, okay, now there are two parts running, I will call them randomly. Before it was too, s too early. But there's also another very important lesson to learn as a developer is that when you call a service, it can also fail. So there are two points. As a client, I want to call a service. When I call a service, it can fail, even so if it runs in the cluster. And if I host the service, I have to tell the Kubernetes cluster when I'm ready. So the two different things. As a Java developer, it depends on which side you are developing your applications, or maybe you have both in the same, but you have to consider that. So things can go wrong, even in an awesome cluster like Kubernetes. OK, let's see the time. Um, OK. So just to show, to deploy the client, I can type fabricate deploy, and it will build the product and deploy it and so on. It's not as interesting, but it, it just shows you how it, it does that. If it it goes a bit online, so it depends on the internet is working. <laughs> it kind of waits down here. Oh, sorry. Oops. Yes, now it continues. So if I go down here, I have this cube command called get pots, and the client is here, and it's about to start up. It has 0 1. That means there's one part but it's not ready. That's this, this one means the readiness probe is not running. So it starts up, so it waits a while until it's ready. And we can watch the part. And after one a while, it will say run one. Now the client is running. And I can, for example, go and say cube logs follow. And I can follow the, the log from the client. Now this is Java application calling the same service. And it will also, you know, round robin between these two applications. Um, so let me just go one. We scale down to one again, because I just want to have one application to run. And this one, you can see now, it's supposed to call the same one. It doesn't do random anymore. And this is because you tell the cluster, OK, there are two running. Now I go down to one. Then the cluster knows, OK, you said you only want to run one. I will just stop calling one of them and only run, call the same one. And that's why it can better scale down in a safe manner, because you know you tell it up front to the Kubernetes cluster. So now it runs there, calling the same one. But what if something goes wrong? Um, uh, how can I test something that goes wrong without letting Kubernetes know it? Because if I use the scale command from Kubernetes, I actually tell Kubernetes, go up or down. Then it says, ah, OK, I know what you're doing. But let's suppose that you're being a bit naughty, and you can actually use Docker, Docker PS, to list the processes running, the Docker process or Docker containers. And you know it's a huge list, but you can kind of see, say, something, hello swarm, this line. And up here, this is the Docker process ID. So we can be a bit evil and say docker kill if I actually copy the right one. And yes, yeah, apparently I did. So I kill this, the client's or the server side. And when the client, it will of course start to fail calling it because I killed it outside the cluster. But we should see what happens in the cluster because now I, it wasn't me. I didn't use the Kubernetes command to, to, to stop it. So if I get parts, 
you may see that it actually says restarts one. So what Kubernetes has done is has, it has detected that inside this pod there was a container running. Now it's died. Uh, okay, so let me restart it for you. And then eventually this one, hopefully, this is where it gets a bit trigger, should recover and start to get a response back. But as I said, the swarm application did not have that readiness probe. So Kubernetes thing is running too early. And it takes a time to start up a uh, Java application. So it might take a 30 seconds or a minute or even longer before this one will recover. But the intention is that with the Kubernetes cluster, you have sort of like a, a big brother watching over you. And it's sort of like keep look at state of the cluster and try to self-heal itself. So if something dies, it starts it again, it restarts it, or maybe move it somewhere else. So that is sort of like the great concept of Kubernetes. It's based on this declarative state, they call it. You kind of just say the happy moment. I just want five of those and 10 of those and three of those. And then you let the Kubernetes cluster figure out how to orchestrate and scale that and manage that all for you. Um, but it seems like the client is not really recovering, but we can try to now. Sometimes it works. <laughs> So let's go back to the slides, and we will see some more. So I just put in the slides to build things. What we tried to do, we could scale up a deployment in Kubernetes using this command line. Uh, we can tell it to use two, two instances or three or whatnot. And, and one thing, if you want to stop an application, you can sell, you just scale it down to zero. Or after that, you can also delete the, the application. There's also a way of scaling your application using the web console. You can go in there and there's also a scale button on the deployment. You can choose how many to run. We saw that the load balancing was not round robbing, but random, but you can choose. Uh, we saw something about errors. You know, errors can happen. So we had this most, um, we saw it from this curl command, like calling a script. But now suppose, you can deal with errors in different ways. Uh, from the client side, you can use something called a retries. So when I call a service, it fails. I just wait a bit and try it again, right? And eventually, it might maybe work. Um, that's one way of dealing with errors. In Camel, you can configure that something called a using an exception. You can say, try at most 10 times and wait one second between, and so on. But this is. One way of doing it is not always the best one, but you know, it all always depends. But it can lead to this problem called the thundering hurt problem. So maybe you have a service here that a lot of clients are calling, and that service is a bit under stress. But all of these clients that call you just retry. So they just keep on, and maybe they come more and more load. So you you did you keep on being under stress. You just no oh, stop. Don't call me. You know that never happened. So in a cloud world, there's another pattern that has become f a bit more famous, and, and it's called the circuit breaker pattern. And there's an implementation from Netflix. They call it Hystrix. Um, it you it's from the real world. You know with electric currency. So if you have all these electric devices, and if they're sort of like a spike. Otherwise, these devices will fry and die. Then there's sort of like a, a circuit breaker that can detect that and flip a switch so the current doesn't continue down. It's the same in Hystrix. It has different states. Now, one thing to get really confused about is, is it open or closed, and what does that mean? Because open, you may assume that's good, but not. Look at the colors. If you're not colorblind, then green is the best one, and it's, it's closed. So closed and green is good. Red and open is not so good. And then in between, there's some sort of half state where you can sort of try and see if it still fails or not and, and go between. In Camel, you can use something called a hysterix, and you can put in whatever you want to do that is protected and orchestrated in this circuit breaker thing. And then you can add an all fallback. The idea with a fallback is saying like an alternative way. So if you call a service and that service fails, Maybe it's okay to do something different. And sort of like a, 
and real world example was uh, Sky Sports in England, UK. Uh, they allowed to watch football games over the internet. And some of the games are really popular, Manchester United, maybe in the England national team and so on. And they have subscribers that pay money for that. But when they go on to see those games, and maybe you know their login service is under stress, so they cannot log in. And if you cannot log in, you cannot see the games, and then people get really angry, right? Because you can't watch the game the day after. You want to see it now. So they have protected their login service using a circuit breaker. So if the service is sort of out of touch, they just say, yes, you can log in. It's better to have a happier custom that can see a game, and maybe some free guy on the internet found out you can log in, you know, using a bogus password, and, and you can see it. So that's an alternative. One way where it does not really want work is like, you know, money transfer. I'd send you $1,000 and it fails, but, you know, it says okay. <laughs> um, it is like you can get a dashboard so you can actually see these uh, circuit breakers going on, what's going on. And depending on the demigods, they have been a little okay with me, or maybe not. We'll try to see that in action in a moment. And here we go. Um, so, I, when I created my cluster, the Minikube cluster, I was a little bit too restrictive in terms of uh, resources I gave it. So when I run too many Java containers in the cluster, they you know, run out of memory. Uh, unfortunately, that means I could not have pre-started uh, all these history stuff, so you... Ah! It, it killed the projector. Uh, so I have to start them manually, and let's see if they oh, works. So I can go here, cube get pots, and they are starting up, so I can type mini cube service histrix dashboard. So what I'm doing here is how do I call a service from my Mac computer or from your Windows or whatever inside that cluster? But it, even though they run on the same machine, they're you know, different. They're running in a virtual machine. But how can I, as an external client, call a service inside that cluster what IP and port number, whatever I'm going to use, I don't really know. But you can tell Minikube, I want to call a service, and this is the name of the service, and it gives you the URL to type. And because you know all your applications and so on, they are a bit dynamic, it may change. So it opens up a history dashboard. Let me just zoom a bit out. And then I can cl click this button, if it works. <laughs> ah, yes. So. Here you can see there's a circuit breaker with five, and it's green, closed, you know, a bit counterintuitive, but that's how it is. So it goes here, everything is happy, happy. And let's just go here and be a bit naughty and do that. Should we do the dog up thing? Uh, dog up, oh, shut this one. Dog up, PS, just hang on. I have to find uh, a lot more parts going on. This is this Hello Swarm one. This is the part ID. Uh, I'll kill it. Uh, let me just, uh, before I do that, I just want to go here. Sorry for oh, this one. Uh, up here. And just want to take this guy and locks follow, cube control locks follow, and then name of the part. And we should see this is the client. It calls the hello swarm, and you see here what's going on, right? So there's client call one service, and now we're about to kill it, right? And we want to see from the circuit breaker and the dashboard, but also from here what's going on. So there's a lot going on. Um, where was it? Here. Now we kill it, if I'm killing the right one. Now that's at one red now. Something is a bit errors now. It's open, it's red. And if I'm quick, I can probably go and see here. Now it says, nobody want to talk to me. That is the fallback I implemented in that history thing. So when it calls the service, the service down, it just says, nobody want to talk to me. So eventually, we should see that this one recovers and, co and get a response, but also the dashboard. Maybe we can just move it over here a bit and maybe wait a bit. It takes a little while before the cluster recover and so on.
if it does. Oh, there's a response now. It actually starts to be green, now it's closed, and everything is recovered. And so that was good. It, that worked, at least. So let's move on. Uh, a few other things I want to talk about. Um, so how do I, as a Java developer, debug my Java application now when they run in a container? If it, I've run it locally, I can just you know debug from my editors directly. But when they run in a cluster, it's a bit different. Um, so thank God there is a on the Fabricate Maven plugin. That's a debug goal, so you can run your application in debug mode, and then it allows. So it runs in the cluster. Uh, the Java JVM is in remote debug mode. It makes a network connection, the tunneling on port 5005 from your local machine into the cluster, into that part. So the Java remote debugger thinks it runs locally. So kind of like a magic thing. So let's see if that works. So what I'm going to do for that is to stop this history thing. And I prepared a script for that. Stop history. And then if we go here. When I call this guy, when I click this button up here, refresh, then the idea is that like, I want to debug. And there's something wrong here. There's something wrong with that response. You know? so I want to debug that. So when I click this one, it goes into debug mode. So I go here, and I can run this debug. Oops, sorry. Debug goal here, Maven fabricate debug. And then there's a little extra parameter. Um, it sort of tells the cluster when you run in debug mode, don't recreate the service. So it's, it's a bit allows me to uh, call this service using the same port number I have here. So if I go here, I, I can still call the service, but I want to enable debugging. So I go to my Java editor, and I have up here, this is just standard Java remote debugging on port 5005, no other changes. This is this default thing then do in idea at least. Then I have a breakpoint thing here, this guy. So this is where I want to suspend. And I click this debug button. It connects to that. You can see there's a little check mark, so something seems to be working. And now I go here and I press refresh. Whoop, it stops in the debugger. And I can say here, okay, I can change the message saying, hmm. Klaus, shut the F up, it's lunch time. And let's see if the computer is smart. Yay! <laughs> it's a very clever computer. And if I refresh again, it goes back in debugging, I debug a second time, I press resume, it comes back to being not so bad anymore. So that's, thank you computer, you're okay. Not gonna be throw you out. So that's the remote debug thing. Uh, hit the breakpoint. And also, how do we actually call a service from your web browser? I talked a bit about it. Minikube service and the name of the service. And it opens the web browser with the, with the link to it. Um, when you, as a developer, get started with this container and cloud thing, uh, I said that was this iceberg, and it's only the top of the iceberg we talk a bit about here today. Uh, there are many things to consider. There's a figure here. You can maybe not read all in the terms, but this is sort of like a good thing, sort of, okay, what is uh, something about stateful service? How do I do API uh, gateways? Uh, how do I do logging and metrics? Uh, how do I do health checks? Health checks was a bit about these readiness probes and so on. And there are many other things, you know. Uh, this uh, figure is from Bilgin. Uh, he's a consultant in the UK that is writing a book on, on Kubernetes as well. Um, one thing that is also gaining a bit of traction of late in relation to cloud and Kubernetes is something, they, a term called service mesh. Um, so what uh, we've done, uh, what I showed here today was that 
when you have applications that want to call each other in the cluster, all this kind of error handling and service lookup and other things is sort of client-side libraries. So in Camel, there were some patterns for dealing with uh, calling a service. You can do some retries, but there were also this history client. But these are packaged together with your application. What if the infrastructure allows to do that for you? So as a developer, you only have to consider or build your business logic, so to speak. This is where service mess come in. So the idea is that you can separate your business logic and have all these you know, service mess kind of things externally from it. Um, and they are still you know, debating a bit about that, but uh, there are different implementation of that. One is called uh, Lingard. Uh, there's another one called Istio, which seems to be gaining popularity. And there's a few others as well. Um, if you want to look uh, more about this, uh, I do think that this is something that, as a developer, we have to um, become more popular. So this is something that we get from the uh, cluster as well. Maybe in the future, it comes sort of pre-baked with uh, service miss out of the box. So you can use that. Um, there's a colleague of mine called Christian Poster. He did a, a YouTube uh, podcast on service mess and there are some demos of that. It's still a bit early technology-wise, but you know, give it a year or two, then it's really you know matured and and, and back then. And you can find it on the YouTube here. There's a link for it. Uh, and speaking of uh, other resources you can consider, uh, there's a free book. Um, Microsoft for Java developers is written by the same guy I talked about before, Kristen Poster. Um, it was sponsored by Red Hat, which is happened to be his employer. Then there are some not so free books. Um, there's a book that's almost complete as well. It's called Kubernetes in Action uh, by Marco. And I think he's from uh, Czech Republic. Uh, that book is recommended as well. And of course, then there's my book, Camel in Action. It uh, will be complete at uh, the start of next year. Um, if there's a discount code called CAMEL39, if you order it from their website, and it gives you 39% discount. Wow. So you can try a different code. Some people have you know, found a secret code. So maybe try with CAMEL100, 99, 98, and so on. I know there's a 50% somewhere looking. Uh, or maybe Camel 200, you get two free books. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so the slides and the uh, source code is on my GitHub account. It's a product called Minishift Hello. And don't despair, this is because when I gave a similar talk a while back, it was not using Kubernetes, it was using a Red Hat distribution of Kubernetes called OpenShift. And they have something called a Minishift, like Minikube. Very the same thing. It's just, you know, I'll say OpenShift is probably a bit more um, platform as a service, more developer thing. It has a bit more developer tools and web consoles that can do a lot more than uh, what uh, Kubernetes can do out of the box. For example, when we built our Docker con uh, image, they were built locally on that machine. I it was actually using Docker, so you had to install all Docker as well. But Maybe as a Java developer, you don't want to touch Doc at all. So what the OpenShift platform can do is to build it for you. So Docker, or, or the, there's like build pipeline and all these kind of things, they are built inside the OpenShift uh, platform. So you can you know, make your build pipelines and they can build Docker image for you. So you don't have to do it on your laptop and so on. You don't get that out of the box with the vanilla Kubernetes. That said, there's many other different distribution of Kubernetes from different companies and organizations. So there's a lot going on. I think the last count they had was about 50 or so different distribution of Kubernetes. You know, uh, It's sort of like, like a Linux thing. There are so many different distribution of that one as well. Uh, I think that's the end of my slides. So we have for early launch or some questions or something. <laughs>